So last night at around 3 a.m., I was writing the script for my new YouTube channel about paleontology until I noticed the world-renowned wordsmith and science defender King Crocoduck posted a new video in which he delivers a well-coordinated scientific bitch slap to this woman, Megan Fox. No, not that one. No, no, that one, yeah. Where she walks through the halls of the Field Museum of Natural History and ridicules the exhibits for being fake. It really isn't the fact that she thinks it's all fiction that bothers me, it's just her arrogance. It's unbearable. At the end of Casey's video, he challenged his viewers to create their own rebuttal. So, let's get to work. I don't know how to say this word, so I'm just going to pretend that I know how to say it. But eukaryotes. Eukaryotes? Alright, here's another, here's another interesting thing. Now they're going to tell you that this is how evolution of the cell began. Eukaryotes are different from other cells because they have a nucleus which contains a cell's DNA, blah, blah, blah. At first, all eukaryotes were single-celled and many still are today. What? If many still are today, then that would support the theory that they have never changed, that they have always been as they are today. Not that they started someplace else and then are here, but they were always this and still are today. This makes no sense. But yet we're still stuck with 100-year-old science. It's disgusting. No one cares. Does no one care? Does no one want to know the truth? Because I want to know the truth. And this, it makes no sense. Honestly, I can't tell what point she's trying to get across here. But I do know that it seems especially arrogant that within a few seconds of saying she doesn't know how to say the word eukaryote, she goes on to explain with confidence why she thinks she knows more about cell biology than the hundreds of thousands of PhD cell biologists who have dedicated their life to understanding the subject. But before she continues, I feel it prudent to point out her obvious psychosis. Megan here has fallen prey to the Dunning-Kruger effect. This is when somebody who has no idea what they're talking about overestimates their proficiency in a topic because they have yet to realize how much they don't know. I may make confident speculations about, say, black holes, but after reading a lengthy Wikipedia article on the subject, I may refrain from making so many positive assertions because I discovered that there is way more to them than I thought, and my half-baked ramblings have no basis in reality. So keep an eye open for signs of the Dunning-Kruger effect throughout her ramblings. They actually put facts down, and you can look at facts, because these are the animals that they've studied and have skeletons for, and so now we can start seeing about these creatures and, and what they did and what they were like and, and what are they made out of, and this is where there's actual science that we have. See? Fossils. That's science. Don't tell me how they got into existence, because you don't have a clue. You don't have a clue. I don't want to hear about your theories and your stupid theories about how these creatures came, came from one cell when you can't prove it to me. You can't prove it. You, no one can prove it. Oh, but well, we think that that's what happened. No, just show me the animals. Tell me about them. Don't tell me that you know exactly how they came to be because you don't. And, it's, and don't tell my children that you know either. That makes me angry. I would prefer that we just tell them it's okay not to know. It's okay to say I don't know. I agree, Megan. There's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know. That's one of the things I love about science. You know, you should try it sometime, because as we'll see later on, you don't seem to know anything. About anything. This is really cool though, isn't it? It's so darn big. Who knows, some of these things might still be down there. No one would ever know. Because you're never going to get to the bottom of, the ocean, of all the ocean floor. It would be really cool to find out though. Megan, the animal you're looking at, that tiny alien beastie, Opabinia, went extinct about a half a billion years ago. So I wouldn't count on finding a live one. Is that the weirdest looking little thing or what? Put those little spikes on its back. Look at these cool things. I can't argue there. Trilobites are pretty badass. These diverse little bastards were around for almost 270 million years making them one of the most successful arthropod groups in history. How do they know this? Who, who says, how do they know this? Okay, if you're talking about 470 million years ago, these are just guesses off the top of their heads. 
If by guesses you mean painstakingly mapping the geology of the entire planet over a period of several centuries to begin to understand by the biostratigraphic relationship shared between geologic formations, or testing for radioactive decay from, say, potassium to argon thousands of times from different sites and then correlating and comparing the data to obtain multiple lines of evidence for the age of the earliest fossils of land plants known to man, then yes, Megan, they're just guessing. First, I love how they grade these things, like, this is what happened, for sure, for sure, this is what happened first. Well, listen how dumb this sounds. First, the ozone layer formed when oxygen began to accumulate in the Earth's atmosphere, provided protection from the sun's harmful radiation. Only the water had provided this protection before. How do you know this? It's, just, it's, a, it's a fairy tale, it's just a fairy tale. I'm just making it up. But we want the whole scientific community and everybody else is supposed to believe this. One way we know this is because of the science of paleoclimatology, where geochemists can test for certain traces found in rock samples from various ages that allude to very specific climatological phenomena. Meanwhile, soils had formed. How do you know? <laughs> How do you know? And this is all a guess. The evidence of ancient soil can be found all over the earth. They're called paleosols. Look at the language. Soils had formed. Not soils may have formed. Soils had formed that could nourish plant life. And so here comes the plants. Even if we didn't have any paleosol samples predating the earliest land plants, we actually do by the way, we would still know that there must have been soil for the plants to grow in. You do know that plants grow in soil, right Megan? Yeah, well, it's a guess. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> but look at... No, there's no other explanation here. There's no other... There's not not one other explanation. Not, well, this could have happened, but maybe this happened. Maybe it all happened at once. Maybe. Maybe there was... Maybe it was alien created. Maybe... No. What the fuck are you talking about? No one knows. No one. And so this... Crazy. Oh look, Earth's first land plants were small and moss-like. Oh yeah? How do you know? Did you have a video camera there? Where's the tape? I want to see the evidence. Well, Megan, seeing as the first camera was invented in 1826, and the evolution of land plants occurred some 450 million years ago, I wouldn't expect any photographic evidence. What we do have, however, are fossils, the direct evidence of ancient life. Where's the evidence? Fossils? These fossils are the evidence? Because you have fossils of plants? This is the evidence I'm supposed to believe that these were the first plants? How do you know? Just a moment ago, I recall you saying how glad you were to see the trilobites because you got to see the actual remains of the creatures in question. Now you're suspiciously skeptical. Why? They evolved from one type of algae. Green algae. Not just a type of algae. They even know the type of algae. It was green. They know the color of it. It's green. Ugh. The verde plantae, the group to which green algae are assigned, is a monophyletic clade. The green part wasn't there just to sound good. Where's the video? Again, where's the video? I want video evidence. Tell you what, Megan. If I ever find a video camera sandwiched between two Ordovician rocks, I'll let you know. It's all just guessing. All of it. There isn't one bit of evidence here. Because, guess why? There's no missing links. Not all these so-called missing links, not one has been found. That is not a hoax, that is not a joke, that is not some kind, somebody's idea of a prank, or someone's idea of trying to get their, their theories made into laws. There is no such thing as a missing link. It doesn't exist. That's why it's called missing. <laughs> That's why they're missing. We don't have any examples of plants going from one type of plant to another type of plant. All we have are examples of plants that have always been algae, that has always been algae and uh, horsetails that have always been horsetails, and ferns that have always been ferns that have never been anything else. But no. We're just going to continue to believe that there are missing links out there, we just haven't found them yet. That's gotta be it. Never in my entire life have I ever heard so much shit come out of one mouth. Everything she said was so wrong, it would seriously take a full 30 minutes to do it justice. But I don't have time for that, and I'm guessing you don't either. So, let's just continue. Much like a parent with a video camera recording the first steps of their baby child, someone was around 370 million years ago to record the first steps of tetrapods from water to land. 
Because that's what they're telling you here. The tetrapods took their first steps around 370 million years ago. Who writes this stuff? How do they know this? They don't. Maybe if you look to your left, you'll notice the nearly complete type specimen of Tiktaalik, one of the most important fossils ever discovered, which provides the best look into the origin of land-based tetrapods. You know, one of those missing links you were just going on about. Oh wait, it's not a missing link, because it's not missing. Maybe that's the way they were made, with feet that could go, like alligators, you know, that are in the water and the land. There's no, it's not like they fell, their fins fell off and then they grew feet. That's what they want you to believe, that their fins eventually fell off and then they grew some feet and started walking on the land. This is the dumbest theory I've ever heard in my whole life. It's, it's not good. It's really not good. It's bad. It's very bad. That would make me, that would, you would have to, do you know how, do you know how complex feet are? Feet, the human feet, are so complex that people who make robots have not been able to replicate feet. They can't make a robot with the same dimensions foot as a human being because it won't stand up. Even when they make it with the exact same specifications as a human foot to a, to a human body, they can't make it stand up. Why? They're so complex that the muscles, the muscle structure, our toes, and everything else, all our muscles work together to keep us standing, standing up and not falling over. Because technically, when you try to make a foot like the human foot, you can't do it. No one can do it. So are you telling me that it's an accident? It's a purely accident. Fins became these incredibly complex feet. Now, I don't, I don't believe that. That's like saying a Coke can does not have a designer. Well. Well, it's, it's got letters on it, though. How'd they get there? Well, the letters fell from the sky, but they were in the wrong order. Now, eventually, over time, though, they moved, and now they say something. No one would believe you if you said that. You're supposed to believe that about feet. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. Are you actually trying to say that scientists believe that fish fins fell off and then feet fell from the sky, and that's where tetrapods inherited their feet from? I can't, I'm just, how can, but if, what? How could you? Oh, and here's the thing that everybody is just trying to get to. We had to walk through all of that just to get to the cool dinosaurs. Really, that's all people want to see. They just want to see the dinosaur bones. They don't want to see any of that, except for maybe those arthropods and stuff under the water. That was cool. But we could have done without all of that and just skip, it, skip ahead to the dinosaurs because this is what the kids come here to see. You know that feeling when you get so angry, you cannot help but starting to speak very softly and enunciating every single word you say to stay calm? Oh, just breathe. So, Megan, what you are telling me is that nothing that existed before the dinosaurs is interesting enough to go into a museum. Honestly, I'm offended, not just as an amateur paleontologist, but as a citizen of the Earth that you would so blissfully disregard billions of years of some of the most beautiful and underappreciated life forms because they're not all big and scary. Earlier you were complaining that you were not seeing the truth, and now you seem to think that the first 3.2 billion years of life history isn't even worth seeing. You are beyond stupid, Megan. Um, they have some of the biggest finds at this Indianapolis Children's Museum. So we go down there's a lab where you can watch them like taking the bones out of the casts you know and because uh, they're constantly working there and they have a skull on display that is clearly a dragon there's no other way to describe it it's a dragon skull it's got horns like here it's got a long snout big pointy teeth 
um, bumps all over its face, bones. That, that, so you can imagine that the skin was stretched over this thing. It clearly looks like the dragons of drawings, very clear. So, so my kids, when we get down there and immediately one of them says, Mom, it's a dragon. And I look at it and I say, my God, it is a dragon. I've never seen anything like that. It looks just like a dragon. It is. It's a dragon. And my mom says, it's a dragon. Look at this. Well, the, the technician goes, oh, no, 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 that's, that's not a dragon. No, no. I'm like, what? what do you mean it's not a dragon? She goes, no, that's a dinosaur. Okay, well, you better look at it. It looks like a, you know, we know what we're talking about, right? Like a dragon with horns and the whole deal. Oh, no, it's not a dragon, no. Yeah, you gotta dash the hopes of my children, you know, because the, the imagination, they just, they can't have that. So then I ask her, well, what's it called? Now, this is the best part. What is it called? She says, Dracorus Hogwartsia. <laughs> you know what that means? The dragon of Hogwarts. The person who found this dinosaur got to name it, and they named it Dracorus Hogwartsia, the dragon of Hogwarts. The cover of Time Magazine is sitting right next to this uh, skull. And the cover of Time Magazine, they've put skin on it to make it look right. You know what the cover of Time Magazine says? Dragons. <laughs> And it's, the thing is, I mean, it looks just like a dragon. I mean, we have to ask ourselves, do we believe, I mean, there's no evidence yet of flying dragons, of, you know, fire-breathing dragons. However, there's plenty of, of people around the world throughout the ages who wrote these stories about dragons, who drew pictures of dragons, who said they saw dragons. And then we have this dragon skull that looks like exactly like a dragon that people have drawn from the stories. And yet, here's this woman in a lab coat saying to me, that is not a dragon. No, 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 no. It's a, it's a dinosaur. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> Language is important, people. It really is. I maintain that that is a dragon. So does the people who made it. So does the guy who discovered it. Hello, Dracorus Hogwartsia. You couldn't make this stuff up if you tried. Really, Megan? No other way to describe it? How about you let me give it a go? Draco Rex Hogwartsia is the name given to a nearly complete skull of what was thought to be a new species and genus of Pachycephalosaur, the group of mostly bipedal, herbivorous, marginocephalian, ornithischian dinosaurs. In 2007, Montana State University paleontologist Jack Horner provided some very compelling evidence that the skull simply represented a young Pachycephalosaurus. So it wasn't even its own species, just a very young morph of a larger species. And it wasn't named by the discoverer, by the way, the paleontologists who described the fossil allowed the public to vote on the name, and they voted for the name Dracorex Hogwartsia. And if you think that the fact that it has the word dragon in the name is proof that it's a dragon, let me introduce you to the Dreadnoughtus, the most terrifying and unsinkable battleships of the early 20th century. This is also called Dreadnoughtus, a brand new sauropod dinosaur named on September 4th, 2014. Ken Lockavara is the scientist who named the animal. So, do you think that the name means that Ken Lacavara actually thinks this dinosaur is a giant battleship? Of course, they can't explain why are there prehistoric drawings on caves of dinosaurs. They can't explain that. They don't even want you to know that. If you notice, we have not seen one of those here, have we? We have not seen a cave painting of dinosaurs, but they exist. They exist. Uh, and they're clearly dinosaurs, like they're not elephants. They have, like they have one of Stegosaurus that has the... The marks the, of the, you know, the, what do you call those things? The bones on the back, okay? They have a, a, a cave painting of a brontosaurus with a big long neck. Now, how do cavemen, how did they know what dinosaurs looked like? Hmm, perhaps they might have seen one? I mean, what, are we going to say that they dug up the bones? They were like, like prehistoric archaeologists digging up bones and then drawing pictures of it? No, I don't think so. Like with skin on them and everything? No, that doesn't make sense. Do you know, I did not know that those things, that cave paintings like that existed until like 10 years ago. That's how, that's how badly they're, co they're trying to cover it up. So, they're trying to cover it up so badly that no one knows that they even exist. It took me 30 years to figure out ex that they exist. And now I'm like, wait a minute, there are cave paintings of dinosaurs? Well, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense with anything that they've told us now, does it? No. Wow, cave paintings of dinosaurs. What's your source, Megan? Um, in a magazine. It was in a creation magazine. <sighs> oh, this is a fantasy. This is a 
fantasy, like dragons. Like, like, except dragons aren't a fantasy. Like, but the, their idea of, oh, well, dragons aren't real. No, this isn't real. This is something they've just made up. Incredible. Yeah, not even close. That model there is based off of the 3.2 million-year-old type specimen of Australopithecus afarensis, nicknamed Lucy. The dimensions of her body are scaled precisely to her skeleton, and the parts we don't have from her, like an articulated skull, can be filled in with the more than 500 other specimens of her species discovered since 1974. Look at this. Though this emerging picture, emerging picture, you know why it says emerging picture? Because they have no evidence for it. This emerging picture can be controversial. Scientists agree on two key points. And, they, and first of all, they don't agree on these points, not at all. Humans evolved from a, an ape ancestor. There are plenty of scientists who don't believe that at all. And they evolved through the same unpredictable process as every other living thing. No, scientists don't all agree on either of those things because there are scientists who do not agree with this, who've been studying it their whole lives. So this, they agree on two key points? Mm -mm. No, they don't. Really, Megan? Tell you what, if you can name me a single paleoanthropologist who doesn't believe that either we are descended from apes or that we are still apes ourselves, I'll give you a thousand dollars. Seriously. There are gaps in the fossil record and many fossils are fragmentary. Mm -hmm. And those gaps just happen to be the gaps that would prove this theory right. But because there are gaps, we're supposed to believe that everything they say is, 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 is right. We're just supposed to ignore the fact that there are gaps. It must be right. Frankly, I think the gaps are important. And you better fill in the gaps before you tell me to believe it, because I don't believe it without the gaps filled in. And there, there's huge gaps here. Gaps? Like where? Name one. I dare you. Sure, they exist, but they're being filled in faster than a creationist can say Ardipithecus. I think it's time that we stop apologizing for the fossil record, and start showing off the true immensity of treasures that have been recovered over the past few centuries. So far, in this century alone, we have made wondrous discoveries, filling in some of the most spectacular and strange parts of life's story, like the origin and diversification of whales, the transition from marine fish to land-based tetrapods, the beginnings of the first dinosaurs from their archosaur ancestors, the ichthyosaurs' earliest land-based precursors, the possible common ancestor of humans and chimps, even the beginnings of our own genus from Australopithecus, and countless others. Don't suck your teeth at me. You always say, don't suck your teeth at me, man. Well, how my fuck don't suck your teeth at me? Well, how my fuck don't give me no reason to suck them? I won't suck them. I don't like sucking them, you know what I mean? You can't be serious. Just seconds ago, you were going on about fossils this, gaps that, and when you actually pass replicas of Lucy and the Turconoboy Homo erectus or Gaster, some of the most precious fossils on Earth, this is the verbal diarrhea that slips out of your pudgy gob. No one considers that Neanderthals could just be people with big foreheads. You know how Eastern Europeans have bigger brows and uh, you know, deeper set eyes and... Um, we're supposed to believe that no, these are just these are ape ancestors. No, I don't think so. I think they're just uh, exactly like how human beings are so different. Humans are all so different from different places, and they look different. The Neanderthal man simply could have been a guy they found with a really big forehead. <laughs> that doesn't prove anything. If by Neanderthal man, you mean Homo neanderthalensis, it was actually an entire species, not just some dude. I suppose, Megan, you're not aware of the hundreds of Neanderthal skeletons found across Europe. We've got Neanderthal babies, children, subadults, adults, and old of both genders, 
as well as the genome of dozens of specimens sequenced by Briggs et al., proving that they weren't just some group of Eastern European dudes, but a morphologically, anatomically, physiologically, and genetically unique species. Anyway, we don't even descend from Homo neanderthalensis. They are our sister species, daughters of the same mother. The mother likely being Homo heidelbergensis. And they were apes, by the way, by definition. Just like you, Megan. So, in conclusion, folks, her points were sloppier than an orangutan's afterbirth. And if the Dunning-Kruger effect was a disease, she would be patient zero. Well, that's all, folks. Thanks for watching if you've made it this far. And if you want Megan to see this video, do what you can by pressing the like button, subscribing, and sharing it. Peace. Oh, I almost forgot. Hail the King Crocoduck in all of his heavenly blessed beauty. Maybe that'll give me some brownie points.